Salem, Massachusetts, a seaside town founded in 1626, now filled with businesses, tourists, and, it would seem, witches. Certainly, the business owners in today's Salem appear bent on capitalizing on the most famous event in the town's history. As one walks the streets, one is continually bombarded by advertisements for witch tours, witch shops, even witches themselves. Palms and auras can be read, daggers and chalices bought, spells taught, for a price. Salem even draws magical personages from the world of entertainment. Samantha of Bewitch, for instance. And, of course, the world's most beloved wizard. The town has a lighthearted and exciting air, which struck me as altogether incongruent with the actual events at the epicenter of all this commerce, the witch trials of 1692. Salem was different then, a village in a puritanical society which was already waning. The original settlers, such as Roger Conant, Salem's founder and subject of this statue, were as giants in the earth. By 1692, their descendants had become ordinary men and women, incarcerated in a culture whose strict social and religious constraints were increasingly untenable. As Vernon Parrington writes in The Colonial Mind, the Puritans had certainly backslid in the ways of culture. The horizons of life in New England were contracting to a narrow round of chores and sermons. The ground, he writes, was being prepared for superstition and bigotry, and the Salem outbreak was the logical outcome of the long policy of repression that had hanged Quakers and destroyed independent thought in its attempt to imprison the natural man in a straitjacket of Puritan righteousness. In 1692, the Puritans had several pressing concerns. Parrington writes that the belief was widespread in New England that the world would end at the close of the century, and that, consequently, the devil would torment the Puritans in one last-ditch effort to draw them from God. The relationship between the colonists and the native people had suddenly worsened. Remember, this was a scant 17 years after Mary Rowlandson was abducted, only miles from Salem. Finally, the British government had introduced a series of reforms threatening the independence of the colonies. Some such as a 1691 charter giving freedom of worship and voting rights to the Quakers, directly threatened the theocratic underpinnings of the society. These stressors increased the pressure on Salem's residents until something had to burst. In fact, the Salem Witch Trials read as a cautionary tale of a society that saw itself as a shining light of morality, beset on all sides by a darkness bent on infiltrating and destroying it. A society that, in its hysterical zeal to seek out and abolish evil, itself adopted evil practices, and staggered from the wide roads of a just civilization onto the ragged trails of a moral wilderness. What happened was this. A few of Salem's girls, notably Betty Paris, the nine-year-old daughter of the town's minister, and Abigail Williams, his eleven-year-old niece, had been experimenting with the occult. For reasons that are debatable and range from guilt to epilepsy to bad rye bread, the girls began having fits and eventually claimed that they were bewitched. The accusations of witchcraft spread rapidly. From the modern perspective, most seem extremely suspect. For instance, several of the accused had connections to the Native Americans or the Quakers. Others were poor or had habits the Puritans found immoral or suspect, such as not attending church or involving oneself too much in the more commercial aspects of Salem town. Most were women whom the Puritans believed more likely to sin than men, citing the biblical story of Eve. Finally, it's probable that some accusations were brought with the hopes of getting revenge on enemies or of coming into possession of so-called witches' property. Calling someone a witch was serious. As the Perkinses write in your textbook, the Puritans had no doubt witches existed. Cotton Mather, whom Perrington states, was regarded by the Puritans of that time period as their most distinguished man of letters, wrote in The Wonders of the Invisible World that an army of devils is horribly broke in upon the place which is the center and firstborn of our English settlements. 
In Salem, formal charges were brought against about 150 people. Many confessed, giving graphic details of how they had joined with the devil and plotted the overthrow of all Christendom. Such confessions seemed to prove that the witch trials were on firm ground. Some found guilty were executed. Mather himself was present at the execution of John Proctor, who figures prominently in Arthur Miller's The Crucible. Samuel Sewell, one of the witch trial judges, writes that Mather stated, they all died by a righteous sentence. However, as the months went on, the trials fell apart. The ranks of the accused began to include upstanding, respected, powerful citizens. More importantly, prominent church and civic leaders such as Cotton Mather's father, Increase, urged the judges to disallow spectral evidence, i.e. claims that the devil took the form of a person with his or her consent to torment another. Such spectral evidence accounted for the vast majority of the cases against suspected witches. Finally, as Richard Goodbeer writes, many of those who had confessed to being witches began to recant, saying that their confessions had been forced from them through the use of torture and psychological pressure. The Salem Witch Trials stand as an illustration of the worst of Puritan society, and an admonishment perhaps to we inhabitants of the modern world to question our own suppositions about where we stand on the moral continuum. To be sure, there are signs that we may have learned something from the trials. For example, in 1697, Sewell, the judge, publicly asked pardon for his role. He writes, in part, that he is sensible as to the guilt contracted upon him at Salem, and he is more concerned than any that he knows of, and desires to take the blame and shame of it, asking pardon of men, and especially desiring prayers that God, who has an unlimited authority, would pardon that sin and all other his sins. And in Salem, near the old cemetery, stands a stone memorial that is, it reads, dedicated to the enduring lessons of human rights and tolerance learned from the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Yet the memorial is tucked away on a side street, providing meager competition to the glitz of the magic shops, and the tour is promising to, as the Salem Visitor's Guide puts it, examine the collective mystique of the infamous witch trials on Salem's original walking tour dedicated to the harrowing events of 1692. You'll note that none of the passers-by even glance at the memorial. And that makes me wonder what, in 300 years, we've really learned.